It's a pleasure and a privilege to be here. It's uh, wet, it's dark, and it's a Monday night uh, in London. I think the last time I spent a wet, dark Monday night in London was Brisbane Road, Late Orient, and Rovers lost that night there, my team. Uh, but the reason you're here, and it's your fault, is there's an election on. So you've only got yourselves to blame. Uh, and the reason I say that is the election that's on for General Secretary of the Unite, the biggest union in the country, 1.5 million members, potentially the most powerful, is three years before it should be, is being fast-tracked, it was sprung on us, and Plan A was unopposed. That was Plan A, and what I say for the last time it's your fault, you're here tonight, is instead of sitting back and watching, and waiting, and wringing your hands in despair. Well, who's going to come forward for a union with hundreds of officials? A union with scores of senior officials? There's never been an unopposed. There's always officials with ambition that come forward, isn't there? Right, left, and centre. And no one, no one came forward. Now, in my view, there's something wrong when that happens. It's inconceivable that everything is good. Now I know there are some good things. Our chair started with these. You know, we're there when we wanted them. <clears throat> and there are some good things. But you know, where you know should be, in the grip of the crisis, the biggest union in the country, 1.5 million, where we have the power if we harness the potential. We could turn the lights off, not just yet. And we could not pay for the crisis, not of our making. When Unite does the right things, I want it to be that that's the norm. That's what we should do. Not get the bunting out. My God, we've done the right thing. Because I think that is another marker of the unopposed, of bringing it forward, of doing things for the union that, in my view, is run from the top. It's a business. Appointed officials are part of the business. Now, I'm not anti-official. I'm for election of officials. And you'll see, as we go through, the differences between Len McCluskey, the other candidate, and I'm not standing against him either. I'm standing for the position of General Secretary, but it seems as though that's a bit of a crime. Just Google anything you want and you'll see the bile that's been uh, poured upon us. I'm not standing against Len McCluskey, I'm standing for opposition. I'm not against <coughs> officials, I'm for elections. You should vote for the official that represents you. That's what should happen in all your sectors, in all your industries. Ian should in construction, Jerry should in buses, Raymond should in aerospace, accessible and accountable to us. And maybe then, maybe then, they wouldn't be running around the country as they are, backing a candidate in this election when they're paid out of our pockets. I'm standing so that we have an alternative. We have an alternative. 1.5 million members will have a choice, a voice, and a vote. Let's just explore some of them. The anti-union laws. Brought in by Thatcher, I know that, I know who the enemy is, I know Thatcher brought them in. Labour left them unchanged. For three terms, three years. Actually the irony is, and somebody will correct my maths if it's wrong, the majority of the anti-union laws through their years are under a Labour government. Anti-union laws, anti-Labour laws, and they were funded to the hill in those three terms, 13 years by the Labour movement between 2001 and 2011 to the tune of £41 million. Not from the TUC or all the unions, simply from our union in the constituents, the TNG and Amicus before them, £41 million. And the reason I focused on the anti-union laws is my first strike. My first strike in the early 80s same height, wearing the same belt, it was the scout belt, they still fits. But a lot younger then. 
was solidarity strike action. It was for the NHS. It was in support of the nurses. They made a call. We at Rolls-Royce and workplaces around the country, we met to decide, would we support them? We discussed, just as I hope we will tonight. I hope there's as much time, more time, for the discussion, for the questions, the comments, the thrash around. That's what we do best. We discuss, we decide, we do. Just like the electricians did when you have no time to wait. That's what you do. And that's what I did. And, the, and at Rolls-Royce, we agreed. And we took solidarity, strike action in support, and so did hundreds of thousands of other trade unionists around the country. And then it was legal. And we've been criminalized. If I did that today, I'd be a criminal. But I would do it today. I would call for it today. And actually, the repeal of the anti-union legislation is a kernel to our success. I'd rather do it within the law. Of course I would. But sometimes you have to judge right over wrong. So what I say, I know brought them in. But the failure, the failure to reverse them, then there's others brought into the mix. Those necessarily that became part of the problem. And our relationship with Labour as a union is part of the problem. And this is another contrast that I just want to explore for a moment. Our relationship with Unite and the Labour Party is one of a one-way relationship. It's too close, it's too cosy. Even when the rhetoric is wrapped up, nothing changes. Do you know Len McCluskey in the last election, a candidate in the last election, the same as I was, said no blank checks for Labour. He's saying the same again. Now, he was right, by the way. There were no blank checks. He wrote six million quid on it in the last two years. And what I say is we keep our money, our precious money, members' money, in clenched fist. Not be handed it over fist to them unconditionally until they do the right thing. That's the Labour Party, Labour MPs, who failed to turn out for the minor errors bill or whatever or the councils who are voting for the cuts, <coughs> if it were me. And I believe if it were you, because I am you, this is game, is what we have in common. I am a member of the union, the 1.5 million, not an official of the union, not with Ed Miliband on speed dial. And that's a contrast which I think is very worthy. So the relationship would be wholly different. If you vote for a cut, you won't get United support. We're against the cuts, aren't we? Well, you'd think. I went on the big TUC march. I bet most of you did too. Fabulous demonstration. But to my dismay, the high-vis jackets with Unite on the top said, not so deep, not so fast. And I want to say, not in your life. I didn't create this crisis. And by the way, that's almost lost. In four years of short history, it wasn't created by us. Our mantra, reminding ourselves and our class and our friends and our neighbours every single day, it's not our crisis, we're not going to pay a penny piece. And all these things link the relationship with Labour, not so fast, not so deep. And from the TUC, if that's the mantra, that's not going to inspire. If the anti-union laws shackle us so we're unable to take supportative action. They have to be ignored or reversed because that hospital, if it's up for closure, that affects me. At some point, I know I'm going to need that hospital. That's secondary action against me. The same as the school or the library or all those other things <coughs> or the job loss. That's either my friend or they live in my street or they're a neighbour of mine or they're in my family. These are secondary actions. So of course I would make these speeches in favour of secondary action, coordinated action, and not just say them, because this is the point I want to move on to now. There's one thing of making a fine speech we've heard to already tonight. I hope we hear fine contributions. But if you make the fine speech, the call for a general strike, which actually would be illegal, 
General strike against whom? For what? Or civil disobedience is illegal. If you don't back that up with actions, there's two things that happen. Because the eyes and the ears of the real enemy, the government and the employers, watch everything we do and they listen to everything we say and so do our members. And they expect us to mean what we say. So when we say the right things, civil disobedience or a general strike and it's not followed up, the two things that happen is the other side fail to believe us anymore that we mean what we say. And the net result of that was heard from the lips of Osborne just the other day when he got he goaded and chided at Miliband, the TUC, and our General Secretary currently, at least until April the 13th, Len McCluskey. And Osborne turned the not so deep, not so fast on his head and said, faster, deeper. This was a result of losing the AAA rating. So stupid am I, I thought that was batteries in my Walkman. Apparently it means something else. But the serious political point was, there has been insufficient opposition. Some things have been good, there have been pop-up disputes and fight-backs, but they haven't even been coordinated in our own union, least of all champions. Do you know the victory that was the electricians? <coughs> These are the people that should be speaking at our risks, our regional conferences, our national conferences, our branches, any victory, so that we learn from that experience, so that we gain the confidence. These are the inspiring things. But I think they're kept relatively low level because then you're able to be on top of it. And this is the thing I want to move on now, is about the recognising opportunities when they come and maximising them to their potential. Because really, that's the leader uh, duty, whether it's the rep in the workplace, or the senior rep, or the branch secretary, or the general secretary. That's our duty to recognise these opportunities, to inspire the confidence to take it on or take it forward. I want to just quote two. <coughs> Vestas on the Isle of Wight was an opportunity just a few summers ago. It produced turbine blades for wind turbines. Green energies, they're going to save the planet, that's what I believe, instead of a thousand years of nuclear waste of Fukushima or seepage or whatever else this disaster that nuclear is. It was popular. It was a factory of 600. It was making a profit. Taxpayers' money had helped put the, the building up in the first place. It was under a Labour government. Ed Miliband, the young Ed Miliband, who we gave £100,000 to from Unite's back pockets so that he could become Labour leader when I bet John MacDonald would have been closer to all of our policies but Unite backed Red Ed Miliband. These are the ingredients. They're making a profit, they're making something to save the planet in a factory on the Isle of Wight. And then, instead of invest like they promised, they pulled the rug. And the workers occupied, fantastically by the way. And it was unorganised trade union. That might have been the key, because it was illegal if it's an occupation. And the unions would say, go nowhere near it, because in some way you would legitimise it. And then you'll have your funds sequestrated. So the eyes of the world was on it. But we were nowhere to be seen as a union. And it went down. But imagine, imagine if the General Secretary had joined those workers in the occupation. The eyes of the world would have seen that. It was popular anyway. And the demand should have been, Vestas, if you don't want it, you can go. But this factory remains and it's taken into public ownership. It was a Labour government. We had the funds. If we'd have kept it in clenched fist, I know this, or I believe this, they would have taken it into public ownership, the same as they've done the East Coast Rail Network. And just a couple of years later, to the tune of a trillion pounds, they nationalised the banks. And now the austerity is the cuts for us and the bonuses for them. I would make uh, one cut. I say this without any hesitation. I would cut Trident and we would save to the tune over the course of its life £75 billion. I would raise 
three taxes. It would be the Tobin tax, the transaction tax. It, after all, it was them that created this crisis. I would raise the mansion tax, put a figure on it, I don't know, million pounds, two million pounds, and I would, uh, uh, I would caution on the bedroom tax because perhaps I would introduce that for ten or more spare rooms uh -huh. and the Queen would have cause to be uh, agitated then with Balmoral in Buckingham Palace and Sandringham and all those other places. The serious point is there is an alternative. There is an alternative. We need not pay a penny piece, but it takes a will and it takes a wherewithal and it takes a strategy. Leverage on the Labour Party are paid after the event, otherwise our millions of pounds are kept in our pocket and organised against these cuts. I'm going to say two uh, last things for now because I want the, the rest to come out in the questions and the comments. The other opportunity was the Olympics. The Olympics, by the way, the bid was won under a Labour government. It, I know it was completed under the condem pardon me, the condemns, but the Olympics, I bet you've all negotiated in your life. It might be cheaper fruit and veg when a pound for two apples is just too much to pay and you negotiate. Or it might be in the workplace, wherever it is. I put you in the shoes of the negotiator on the Olympics. It's been signed, it has to happen, it can run over in cost, but it has to happen on this date. What would you ask for? Would you ask for shiny boots? Well, perhaps. Would you ask for the best hard hat? Well, most certainly. Would you ask for the first 3,200 workers on that project to be those that are on the illegal blacklist? Well, definitely. And the question never came. Never came. And that's to the shame. I tell you what, it's fine that the bus workers got £500 uh, in the, uh, the course of the negotiations on the Olympics. But if that's the scale of our ambition, then it's wrong. And it couldn't be more wrong because it's blinkered. There's not enough vision. The next opportunity that comes can either be seized, once recognised, and pushed forward to take on the anti-union laws. One that would be popular, it might be the bedroom tax. It might be someone in our street. It might be our next door neighbour that simply can't pay any more. And then it's up to us to ring fence it so that there isn't an eviction. It might be that. It might be in London, it might be in Bolton, it might be in Bristol, I don't know. But if the General Secretary is there alongside them, the eyes of the world would be on it and you lead by example. And I think then all things are possible. By the way, if the Berlin Wall can come down, if apartheid can end, we can overturn the anti-union laws. Where's the will? Where's the wherewithal? So, in my last zero minute, <laughs> is this. I think the next opportunity right here, right now, is this election. And by the way, we didn't call it. I know we're being called all manner of things uh, for those that received the text or the emails or the letters. But we didn't call it. It's been brought forward three years to avoid a clash with the general election. Not our choice. And it was cooked up last summer. Last summer not sprung on us as we saw in December. This thing was planned a long time ago in conjunction with very senior Labour officials to avoid the embarrassment of what? I say that was our best negotiation with our money in clenched fists to say to Labour, well, you'll get it when you get in and you do the right thing. And this is our platform. We've squandered that opportunity. We've brought it forward not one year to avoid the clash, not two years to avoid the clash, three years so that one member in this union could stand again. It's been brought forward three years, and this isn't an age thing. This is simple mathematics, so that Len McCluskey could stand for a second term. Because if it was one year brought forward, he'd have been 69. And it's not an age thing, but it might not have been a vote winner, given the retirement age is raised to 67. If it was brought forward two years, he'd have been 68. 68 is too late. That's a TUC campaign. That's not a vote winner, Len. So he brought it forward three years. The whole thing has been manoeuvred to be unopposed, to suit one member above all others, and suit the Labour Party. Listen to these words. 
on this wet night in London. In 2014, the year the prelude to the general election, Unite will fund and put into you, uh, the Labour Party's coffers up to £10 million pounds to fund their election campaign. And it will be unconditional because they're already refusing to reverse or pledge to reverse any of the cuts. So our opportunity is this election. And our members, 1.5 million, are receiving the ballot papers from today. And the contrasts could not be greater. There are not four candidates, or six candidates, or three candidates. There's no right wing candidate, the demon in the dark. Vote for Jerry Hicks. You'll get let the right wing in. No, there's none of those. The choice is just two candidates, one vote, with a contrast that's there for all to see. The election of officials, not appointments, accountable and accessible to those that elect them. Leverage on Labour, do it, you get your payment after you've made the change. Rank and fire se sector organisation in every sector, not just construction, that should be the model, not the exception. You get the union back to hand it back, not less. We wouldn't scrap community branches, they're a good idea. We want more and quicker. It took mine eight months and we still haven't got a bank account. There's no sense of urgency for this crisis. April the 1st is coming and so are the cuts, the cuts, the cuts, the cuts. Workplace branch reorientation is a good thing. But it shouldn't be by dictate, it should be that members decide. That's the way we reconnect. A general secretary on an average wage not £2,000 a week, every week, no matter what. These are the contrasts that you will read when you get your election address. So I urge you not just to read yours, not just to place your cross in the box, because this is the opportunity. Our union is so big that an extra 1% turnout. At the moment, 85 out of every 100 either don't know the election's taking place or have no intention of voting in the election. If we're able to say, if we're able to get the message out that there is a choice, a stark choice, and these turn in this position of crisis, that's what we need, <coughs> then I think that 1% is 15,000 votes, 2% would be 30,000 votes. And my final point is we've stood twice before, and I say we, because I am you, I'm simply a member of the union. And each time, the predictions were we'd finish last. We'd let the right wing in was the predictions and we'd finish last. And each time, those soothsayers could not be more wrong. In the first election, we beat the right wing easily. We beat two senior national officers easily. We finished runner-up with 40,000 votes. And in the last election, we beat the right wing easily. By the way, he then was given a quarter of a million pounds to leave the union. Our money. And we beat the other senior official and assistant general secretary easily. She finished last and was promoted. Promoted, actually carried out the internal investigation against blacklisting in construction. He couldn't find anything. It's there if you look. And then we have 52,527 votes. I tell you, this election is much closer than any of the predictions. Any of the predictions. So this is our opportunity. I know that's in your hearts. I know that's in your minds. Let's have the discussion. Let's discuss, decide, and do. Thank you.